Michelle Derrick was lost, a 19-year-old runaway. I broke my mom's heart. I really did, but she was always there for me. But nobody was there for Michelle late one Friday night when two monsters in a pickup truck snatched her off the streets in Portland, Oregon. It turned to violence, him slapping me, um, restraining my hands, and I knew at that point that um, this was not going to end well, and it didn't. And then he knocked on the back window between the canopy and the cab of the truck, and I didn't know if there was one person back there or so. I didn't know what was going to happen. What did you see? Another individual came around and helped him restrain me. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to die soon. According to Detective Bruce Parks, the men taped Michelle's mouth shut, threw a pillowcase over her head, and chained her to the bed of the truck. They had handcuffs, they had straps, they had eye bolts in the, in the bed of this truck to bolt her down so she couldn't get away. They, they put, were prepared. They were prepared. Does she have any idea how far she traveled in this no, truck? No, she said... She it, was bolted down. Yeah, she and they were sexually assaulting her. One of them was in the back, was sexually assaulting her. On the way. On the way. Michelle is led to a house, dragged inside a room, and chained to a bed. That's when they yank off the pillowcase. When you're able to open your eyes and see the room in front of you, what is the first thing that stands out to you? Oh, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die because there's bars on the inside of the windows. It's I like had a torture no house. house. Yes, it was a torture house. When she wasn't chained to the bed, Michelle was bolted to the floor of a closet. They really didn't speak a lot to each other. This was well rehearsed and that didn't make me feel any better about my future. The men sometimes wore eye masks, took Polaroids of their sexual exploits, and used a taser to control their prey. So you don't know if you're gonna get electrocuted if you move too much. You, you don't know. You don't know if you're dying in that closet that day or the next day or if they're gonna kill you in the closet. You don't know what's going on. You don't know where you are. You were raped and you were sodomized countless times and other things too, things that I hope I never have to speak on. We will die with some secrets because we have to. After seven agonizing days of sexual slavery, Michelle's nightmare comes to an abrupt end. Why did they let her go? We don't know. She actually felt that they were, she was never going to be seen again. She thought she was dead. She was surprised when they threw her out of the car on the street corner, like garbage, but that's what they did. Michelle ran to police and revealed the terrible details about her living hell. But remember, she was essentially blindfolded and had no idea where she was held captive or who her captors were. Michelle ended up being put in that room and they, you know, they um, had a litter box in there for a bathroom for her. It was just disgusting. A litter box? Yes, it was disgusting. Uh, and then when they'd pull her out and take her down to the bed and strap her down and do their, their uh, nasty deeds, and then they'd put her back in the closet again. Michelle told police everything she could remember. She even broke down and made a confession of her own. I got involved in drugs and then I started selling my body to support my addiction. And that's when my life really changed. It also changed the way police looked at the case. No one really took it seriously. They didn't, and that was the she thing. she had been in trouble. Yeah. But one cop did take her seriously. Officer Harry Jackson, a veteran on the Portland Vice Squad. I think she was telling me the story because I was out there every day, and... She felt like she could trust you. Yes, she, 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 she felt she could trust me. She said that she had been kidnapped by two young men who picked her up for a $30 car date and then immediately imprisoned her, took her to a home, put a bag over her head, and held her captive for what she thought were six or seven days, tortured her, tased her, raped her, and did what she called unspeakable things to her, which when you're having a frank conversation between a cop and a prostitute, that's saying something. It was kind of hard to believe in the beginning of this happening, didn't discard it. But, you know, I kind of filed that away because there was not much I could do because I was not a detective. The situation, in a sense, scared you straight to the point to where you were not going back to that life again. Yeah, it got me on the right path. Yeah. 
While Michelle moved on trying to piece her life back together, the case appeared it may never be solved. Until another shocking tale of abduction and torture emerged, but this one with a twist. For seven grueling days, Michelle endured unspeakable sexual abuse at the hands of two twisted predators, surviving under the constant threat of death. She was taken into this house, strapped down to the bed. I'm thinking I'm gonna die. Instead, Michelle was set free, unable to identify her attackers or where they kept her. For two years, the case was dead. Then, Detective Bruce Parks received a call about 17-year-old Andrea Hood, who also claimed she had been abducted and raped by two men. The crime was so bizarre. And what she was telling us about the bars, inside the windows, what on the inside. What did she say? She said that it was like a house of horrors. But there was one big difference. Andrea was able to escape by breaking out one of the windows without bars. She's running down the street with no clothes on, yeah. blood. All over her all legs over and her, her arms. And she's screaming and yelling. A neighbor heard Andrea's screams and brought her inside and called police. Cops easily locate the house where Andrea was held in the Portland suburb of Hillsboro. The two men living there are Vance Roberts and his younger half-brother, Paul Jackson, who claim they didn't kidnap Andrea at all. In fact, they were only trying to help her. Says, no, no, we just, this girl, we thought we, she was homeless, we were trying to help her out, and she went crazy, tried to steal some money, and jumped out our window, and they had just a- They had a different a, story a than different what she story. was telling. Exactly. Armed with a warrant and a camera, Detective Parks takes a tour of the suburban slave cave. Now we're gonna be entering into the kitchen area. They immediately find proof. Andrea's telling the truth. And here we've got, as indicated by the victim, bars on the inside of the window. They even find a Polaroid of the teenage victim. And on the refrigerator, identified by Officer Erickson as the victim, of uh, the sexual assault, as mentioned by her, that was taken of her and was on the kitchen. Okay, I'm now going down the hallway toward to the master bedroom. According to her, this is where she was contained or where the crimes occurred. Here you also see the bars on the windows in the bedroom that she talked about that kept her from leaving. We've got a pair of handcuffs right there on the dresser. That's the victim's white t-shirt. That's a fitted diaper. Okay. In her statement, Andrea tells police, quote, they kept making me change my panties. Cops found evidence of that too. Also in the top drawer, we've got uh, several more. They look, are they brand new? Like brand new, some of them, some of them are used. Okay. Detectives also uncover graphic magazines featuring rape and bondage. Andrea talked about how they asked her to say over and over again to them, I love you. How twisted is that, that you kidnap a 17-year-old girl from the streets of Portland, imprison her where she doesn't know where she is in a house with bars on the windows, rape her, tase her and electrocute her, and then demand that she say, I love you. Okay, now we're going back into what the victim called uh, the closet area that they were remodeling and uh, was soundproofing once they said they were going to uh, keep her. I mean, it literally is a scene from a horror movie, a woman chained to a bed trying to extricate herself while two men are 10 feet away hammering soundproofing up in their torture chamber so no one will hear her screams. At that point, I just knew that if I ever got in that closet, I might not ever be seen or heard from again. See, here's the chains that are hanging from the ceiling. 24 hours into her captivity, Andrea risked her life on a daring escape. They kept wanting her to read a book, How to Be a Good Girl, and she finally realized the only way she was gonna get one handcuff off was to say, okay, I'll read your book. So they took off one restraint so she could 
so she pretended like she was reading the book. At the meantime, while they were going in and out of the room working, she managed to slip off the other cuff and then her leg restraints, and then she ran for that room. One of the guys was yelling, get her, get her, she can't get away. She was able to run and exit this bedroom by going out a window. She said she literally broke the window out with a gun and then flew out it. She cut herself up pretty good, and we later learned that one of the suspects, which was Vance Roberts, he actually cut himself up pretty good as well on that window. And this is the window from the outside. The curtain's still hanging outside. The screen is off well as glass. Vance Roberts and Paul Jackson are placed under arrest, but Detective Parks has a potential bombshell on his hands. Was he dealing with serial sexual perverts? During the search of the house, we found a lot more Polaroid pictures of other women bound, handcuffed, hanging in the hallway, on the bed. This wasn't their first time. It wasn't their first time. Who are these women? Did they suffer an even worse fate? For help identifying them, Parks turns to veteran Portland beat cop, Harry Jackson. Uh, I was contacted by uh, uh, Sergeant uh, Parks, and uh, he had a number of photographs. And a certain name came up, and it says, I know this lady here. You knew one of the women? Yes, and that's Michelle. And then he says, you know, I remember her telling me a couple of years ago about kid being kidnapped off the streets, held as a sex slave for a week, and then released back into Portland. Uh, it was kind of devastating for me because uh, I realized for two years after M Michelle had reported that to me that things were still going on there and that she had a legitimate uh, complaint. For years, Michelle never thought she would get justice until one call changed everything. Harry Jackson identified me, and I, that's what led Bruce to me. Bruce Park showed Michelle a photo lineup to see if she could pick out the suspects. She looked at it. She picked out both of them immediately and started crying because she says, I, no one ever believed me. No one ever believed me that the, what these guys did to me. And you know, here you, you are. You believed her. I did. While still trying to determine the fate of the other victims in the Polaroids, prosecutors prepare their case against the suspects. But on the eve of the trial, while out on bail, the brothers simply vanish. They were gone. They were gone. And uh, now I turn from the investigation of uh, trying to find other victims to to find them. Trying to find the suspects. Yeah, exactly. Vance Roberts and Paul Jackson, half brothers, entirely sadistic. Together, they cruise the streets of Portland, preying on young women, overpowering them, chaining them to the bed of their truck, and holding them captive in their twisted playhouse of perversion. I think if this story was made as a movie, it would be roundly criticized for being so awful that no one should tell this story. And it really happened to people. Inside the house, detectives found shocking evidence of depravity graphic bondage magazines, a manual on how to kill, and handwritten notes on other women they were stalking. According to some notes I found, looked like he was scouting reports. He wrote little notes about young female, 30th and Sandy, another one at this location. It looked like he was out looking for future this victims. Next victim. Yeah, before his brother would come into town. At least one of the men wore a mask, and according to Andrea Hood, both called each other Bill to conceal their identities. Both of these women thought they were going to die. What happened to them was awful, and they thought it was leading to a hastily dug grave somewhere outside of Portland, Oregon. If not for Andrea Hood's dramatic escape, which led police to identify another victim, Michelle Derrick, the depraved duo may have gotten away with their heinous crimes. And really, in a way, she's my hero, because if it wasn't for her, the house may have never been identified. But sickening pictures found inside the house revealed even more victims. They made them smile. They liked to take Polaroid pictures of them in different positions and different places. But they always made them smile like they were uh, Like a prize. Happy. Yeah. 
Who are these young women and could they have suffered an even worse fate? Before the two brothers could answer, they skipped bail. Predators on the run from justice. U.S. Marshal John Moody was tasked with finding the fugitives. We fielded tips all over the country. Uh, I have a book, just a binder filled with tips of, uh, from every state. But weeks turned into months, months into years, and still no sign of the suspects. I was definitely hopeful, and you just start hitting a lot of dead ends, and it kind of takes the wind out of the sail, so to speak. Michelle and Andrea did their best to move on with their lives, but spent every day living in fear. Were you always looking over your shoulder? Oh, yeah. I was really concerned about my safety, my husband's safety, the safety of my home, my loved ones, because of the horrific things they had done to me. I had no reason to believe that they were gonna stop at me. 16 years passed when suddenly, out of the blue, Vance Roberts walked into a Portland police station. I got a call, it was from the jail, and they said, Vance Roberts just turned himself in on our warrant, and our file shows that you are to be notified immediately. And I go, are you sure? <laughs> I'm going, he turned himself in? Even more shocking, Roberts claimed he had been living on the streets and sleeping under bridges for the last 16 years. So I said, let me see your hands. So he showed me his hands. They weren't weathered. They were, you know, well-groomed. He hadn't been living on the street. Where do you think he was staying? Good question. I think family somehow was still assisting him. But the most surprising twist is why Roberts chose to stop hiding. There's a statute of limitations in Oregon. If you're not brought to trial within a short period of time, like five years, you can beat the statute of limitations. Unfortunately for him, he didn't read all of the statute. Once you've leave the state, the clock stops. You could prove he was yeah. out of state? Oh yeah, because the car that he left, his brother and him drove away and was found by the FBI in Phoenix, Arizona in a storage shed. He's thinking the statute of limitations ran out. I think so. He was wrong. He was wrong. After nearly two decades, Vance Roberts, the suspected ringleader in the House of Horrors, was forced to face Michelle in court. You brutalized me, you terrorized me. You left me mentally and emotionally crippled beyond words or expression. Oh, he was arrogant, he was rude, he was mocking me and making fun of me. He was belligerent. Right. And he was not going to give up. He was not going to be quiet. Everybody knows about the 10 of their victims, so I'd like to know where their bodies at. He was not only rude to uh, the two victims when they tried to testify, he was rude to the judge, and that didn't work out well for him. The judge uh, gave him the maximum sentence. And doesn't obviously have any remorse whatsoever. Vance Roberts is convicted on 24 counts, including first degree kidnapping and rape. He's sentenced to 108 years with no chance of parole. It was a very quick verdict. Yet Roberts refuses to say what happened to the other women in the photos or where his brother Paul Jackson, his creepy partner in crime, might be hiding. Lots of people thought Paul Jackson was dead. But U.S. Marshal John Moody was still determined to get his man. One of the things we say is they have to get lucky every day. We only got to get lucky once to track down a fugitive, and that's what happened in this case. 16 years after he jumped bail, Vance Roberts was finally convicted of his crimes, receiving 108 years behind bars. Yet police still have two big mysteries on their hands. What happened to the other women he bound and tortured? And where was his brother in crime, Paul Jackson? We have other pictures. There's other victims out there we don't know about and what their fate, what happened to them, we don't know. Desperate for help, authorities teamed up with the TV series The Hunt with John Walsh in hopes of generating a tip on Jackson's whereabouts. The story of Paul Jackson and his brother Vance Roberts was one of the most chilling and deeply disturbing stories that we did on The Hunt. But with Jackson now missing for 24 years, series co-executive producer Ted Schillinger had his doubts about scoring a hit. We thought that Paul Jackson was a long shot. Uh, you know, the odds were very high against us catching him. But the story of Andrea and Michelle, what they endured, compelled them to try. They are amazing women. And each of them said, 
I am doing this because I want Paul Jackson caught. When Paul Jackson is caught, my life will then change and I will be able to move on. That was our mission and so we told a very frightening story. We actually got a tip that somebody was staying at Walt Disney World uh, right after the hunt aired. Uh, and we sent deputies to the room, uh, knocked on the door, and it happened to be some people from Canada, uh, but not Paul Jackson. But not Paul Jackson. Right. Paul Jackson hasn't been seen since 1991, but months after the show aired, U.S. Marshals received a surprising call from an anonymous source in Guadalajara, Mexico, about a man named Pablo Bennett. Pablo is Spanish for Paul. So what I did is I just went on Google like most people do and I typed in Pablo Bennett, comma, Mexico. LinkedIn pops up from 1991 till current, all these electronic type jobs in Mexico. And after more than 20 years looking for this creep, there he is. Turns out Paul, AKA Pablo, has been living a comfortable life south of the border. Paul Jackson had separated from his brother and headed across the Mexican border to make his life anew in Mexico and had basically stayed there ever since. He had married, he had had a couple of kids, he had a steady job. U.S. Marshal John Moody immediately alerts Mexican authorities. And they approached him at his work, uh, which was the last address on his LinkedIn account. And uh, he came out peacefully to him. They asked for him to come out, he came out, and then he was uh, ultimately taken into custody right then and uh, quickly extradited to the United States. And he said some things like, oh yeah, you're that, the guy that just would never give up. You just, you're the jerk that just kept after us. And I said, yeah, yeah you remember me. He looked defeated, like he knew it, it, was, it was over. But Moody and others strongly suspect that someone kept Jackson's secret for more than two decades, his own father. He knew exactly where Paul was at. Yes. The entire time. Yes. Do you believe his father has helped him? I believe he did. He needed help to stay under the radar. And he would go visit the family in Mexico. And I'm pretty frustrated that there's never been any charges brought against his dad. Some at home would say, why not charge Paul Jackson's father? Right, and that's a good question. And as far as I, I that would be up to the district attorney here in Washington County to decide what they want to do. Jackson's father told investigators he had no idea where Paul was for all those years. But Marshall Moody says he has evidence that proves he knew all along. Once arrested, Jackson's lawyers argued that Paul was merely a pawn and his half-brother's deviant schemes to kidnap and torture women like Andrea and Michelle. Both women testified and reported that Paul Jackson was the follower, Vance Roberts was the ringleader. That couldn't matter less. Both men participated in violent acts against these women. You know, there were people in Mexico who wrote about Paul Jackson saying what a wonderful man he was, how he turned his life around, how he was a wonderful father and a worker and a friend. What do you have to say about I'm that? not buying it. I'm not buying it for a minute. Paul Jackson was every bit as guilty of these crimes as Vance Roberts. The judge agrees, but only to an extent. His half-brother Vance Roberts got 108 years behind bars, but Jackson accepted a plea deal. And after 24 years on the run, he is sentenced to 18 years in prison. 18 years is definitely a long time in jail he for anybody. He will not see his children grow up. He probably, no, he will not see his, his two children grow up. But it's not a life sentence, and investigators are still haunted by the innocent sex slaves and these terrifying photos, many of which are so graphic, we can't even show you. So we have all these pictures, and the pictures are something you can't put in the press. You can't release them to the news media. And you can't release pictures of naked women. Women. On Smiling. The, right, on the that. news. Exactly. How can Crime Watch Daily help you? We need to find the other survivors. I think that's our goal right now. It's part of my mission. Paul Jackson, the half-brother of Vance Roberts, eluded capture for 24 years. But thanks to an anonymous tip, he was brought back from his comfy life in Mexico to answer for his heinous crimes in Oregon. Paul Jackson was the muscle. Paul Jackson was the one who came out of the back of the truck where he was hidden and grabbed the women and wrestled them into the bed of the truck where he chained them into the bed of the truck using an apparatus that had been prepared and welded or screwed into the bed of the truck. 
Jackson's half-brother Vance Roberts was sentenced to 108 years without the possibility of parole. But Paul Jackson accepted a plea deal and got only 18 years, which means he could be back on the streets. And what of these other victims who only live in old, unidentified Polaroids? They're awful photographs. They're the kinds of photographs that are haunting. Once you see them, you never forget them. Like Andrea Hood and Michelle Derrick, it's feared these women were snatched off the streets of Portland, held captive in chains and cuffs, and repeatedly raped and terrorized by the sinister siblings. I mean, I, th I thought I was going to die at the hands of these two. Could these other victims be found? And if so, could they finally seal the fate of the Blood Brothers? They can be tried again. Time can be added to their sentences, and time that should be added to their sentences if they are found guilty of additional crimes. It's worth doing it. The story's not over. You agreed to team up with Crime Watch Daily, and we have agreed to help bring on a sketch artist mm -hmm. to help with some of these other victims. Yes. What are you hoping to accomplish? We can't publish the pictures of nude women in bondage. It's just not appropriate. It'd be yeah. nice to know their story. It would, would be nice to know their story. We travel to Washington, D.C. to join Bruce Parks, Harry Jackson, and Michelle Derrick as they work with a forensic artist to bring these faces to life for you to help police find them. This is going to be a great asset because we've never done this before on this case. Obviously, when I seized them, they were uh, women in compromised positions or uh, in bondage, things that we cannot put out to the media. This is a very disturbing image, this image, um, and this is one that you will sketch mm -hmm. of the young yes, girl's the young face. Lady, yes. Although you're retired now, this is a priority for you. Yes, it is. You really want to see it to an end. So this is the first time you've ever seen these images. It is. I've heard about them, and I know about the other women, but I've never seen the pictures. My mission is to identify the other women and just hope that loved ones, families, friends, maybe a child, offspring, can come forward and say, yeah, that was my little sister. Here she is. I'm going to walk her through this. One by one, faces are pulled from the graphic Polaroids, recreated in detail by the forensic artist. Here are two of the victims as they would have appeared at the time of their captivity. And here's an age progression image to show what they might look like today. Take a good look. If you think you recognize these faces, you might hold the key to unlocking a decades-long mystery. What I'm hoping is we get a name to those faces. It would be nice to, to close those cases out. If you are one of the women in these photographs, if you recognize yourself in one of the photographs and remember these events happening to you, if you know someone in one of the photographs, pick up the phone and call someone. This was one that's haunted me for a lot of years uh, just because these two guys, what they did was extremely, extremely just out there. No one treats, should treat anybody like that. It's my turn to serve. I've already survived. That, that's clear. So now I've, it's my turn to serve. Hopefully I can serve these, these other, hopefully, survivors out there. If you know who these women are or where they might be, you're asked to call the Hillsborough Police Department or Crime Stoppers of Oregon. That number is 1-503-823-HELP.